questions about all the things that we have done so far, including the labs. So are there any questions about the labs? Any particular item you want me to go over before we move on? And no questions. All right. <clears throat> so if there are no questions, then we are going to move on, which is uh, kind of the pace of this class is, you know, you guys have to let me know what you want me to go over, you know, um, so I can go back and go over some of the earlier material. So what we're going to do today in the lab is you're going to have a new lab and it is, uh, we, are, we are actually going to work on the carry look ahead adder. Uh, it's only three by three bit by three bit, which means everything you actually need to know about it is already in the module that we have been, we have been uh, going over, which is the addition module, the binary ad number addition module, which also means you're know, reading it is actually quite important, especially after a class, you go back to read it again, Hopefully that will make it a little bit easier. Okay, combined with your own notes that you are you have taking you, know, you have been taking in class. So we are pretty much done with binary addition. So we can now move on to subtraction. Do we have any questions about addition before I switch gear and start to talk about subtraction? We good here. All right, excellent. So we are going to move on to the next reading module. So the reading module, I'm just sequentially going through from top to bottom. So the next reading module is binary number subtraction. And this is going to be our new topic. And as usual, it starts with uh, base 10 stuff. So we'll go through some base 10 stuff first, you know, which is not in the module. And then we'll go ahead and uh, take a look at um, you know, the rules or the structure of uh, base 10 subtraction, and then we'll do exactly the same thing, which is extracting the structure, and then we apply that to binary subtraction. Yes? Uh, how many more modules go to exam one? So exam one typically go over addition, subtraction, for sure. Um, it's the time, usually that happens in week five or six-ish. So, you know, we are in, what, week three right now? So we got about two more weeks here before we have exam one. All right, so that's a good question. Um, all right, so let me start up the tablet. The tablet is already here. It's just that, you know, I have not started up the, uh, the screen copying. So here is screen copy. And it always starts, okay, I can probably figure out how to make it start at the right place so I don't have to re- position it every single time. So there we go. All right. So what we'll do is, uh, this is from another class. Let me switch back to the notes for this class. So we'll go back, CISP 310, Tuesday, Thursday, and we'll create a new notepad for today. <clears throat> there we go. So we'll do some subtraction here. This is all being base 10. So let's see if we remember how to do subtraction in base 10. So we'll start with uh, 135 and subtract from it. Uh, let's try 100 and 27. Okay, there we go. Okay. So we'll do the sub we'll do the subtraction and many of you will look at this and go like, "Oh, I know the answer already." The answer is eight, and that would be correct, okay? But I want to go through the entire exercise just so that I can you know, go through the, the formal process of how we figure out all the digits. So once again, we have X, we have Y as the name of these, of these two rows. This is Q, okay? We still have Q, X, Y, Q are still here. And then we have T, and then we have D as the difference, okay? so. The names are slightly different because we're dealing with subtraction. T is the abbreviation of take, okay, you know, which is another word for borrowing. You know, we are taking away something. So T for take. And the reason why I do not name it as borrow is because B is a function. So we are going to deal with the name of a function as B. So there's another subtraction here. And just like with addition, unless I am chaining 
um, a bunch of you know subtraction. If there's an earlier one, and I have a borrow, you know, from the earlier subtraction, the t zero is usually assumed to be zero here. So this is the starting point. So the first thing is we do is we look at five minus seven, and what is five minus seven? There are two possible answers. One is oh, it's negative two. But negative two is not going to help me here because I'm trying to do a multi-digit subtraction. So what is the other way to look at the result of five minus seven? Fifteen minus seven. So it's fifteen minus seven because five itself is less than seven. So I cannot do that subtraction. So what I do is I borrow a ten from the next digit. So the five becomes a fifteen. 15 minus 7, ah, that I know. And the answer is 8, right? So we have an answer of 8, but we also have to remember that we borrowed 1 from the digit to our left-hand side. Is that okay? All right, so this is not any different from the usual way that you perform multi-digit subtraction. It's just that the way I arrange the digits is a little bit different. It's a little bit more spelled out, okay? And now I look at um, 3 minus 2, it is a 1, and 1 minus 1 is a 0, but I can do, deal with that later. And then 1 minus 1 is a 0 here. And then I have to look at the borrow you know, at this location here. And this borrow can be because of this digit minus this digit, but 3 minus 2 does not need to borrow, so it has a borrow of 0. It can also be coming from this digit minus this digit. 1 minus 1 is a 0. It does not have a borrow either. So I have an overall borrow over here. And then I figure out you know, what is 8 minus 0. That is just 8. 1 minus 1 is just 0. 0 minus 0 is also a 0. But I just like with addition, I have an overall borrow that needs to be here. So with that particular borrow, I have to look at 1 minus 1 does not need a borrow. 0 minus 0 also does not need a borrow. So I have an overall borrow of a 0 over here. So this is one example. I'll give you another example. So the other example is going to be um, 261 minus 267. Okay. So we'll do the same thing. We have row x, we have row y row Q, row T, and then we also have row D over here. Just like with before, we give it a default of T0 being 0, and now we do the same kind of you know, subtraction. 1 minus 7. What is 1 minus 7 in a multi-digit subtraction? 1 is less than 7, right? Yeah, so the subtraction cannot occur. What do I need to do? So I'm with a B. Borrow, exactly. So because 1 is less than 7, I need to borrow 1 from the next digit. But the next digit is only dealing with the quantities of 10s. So I'm actually not borrowing 1, I'm borrowing 10. So the 1 becomes 11. 11 minus 7 is a 4. So the single digit difference is a 4, but I end up with a borrow of 1 that I need to put here. So the next thing we do is uh, for digit 1, where we have 6 minus 6, ah, that's an easy one, is a 0, and then we have a 0 minus 1. Okay, so once again, 0 is less than 1, which means, oh, I need to borrow 1 from the next digit. So these are the tens, okay, digit 1 you know, specifies the tens, so I need to borrow 1 from the hundreds. But all I need to know is the next digit is 10 times what I have. So I'm still borrowing 10 from the perspective of digit 1. So that means the 0 here becomes a 10. 10 minus 1 is a 9. Okay, so this is a 9 here. This is a 4 here. So when it's time for me to figure out the borrow that needs to go here, I have to remember there are two chances to end up with a borrow of 1. This digit minus this digit can create a borrow of 1, but this digit minus this, this digit is a Q1 minus T1 can also give me a borrow, which is the case in this case, okay? Because 0 minus 1 gives me a borrow of 1. 
So that means I have to put a 1 here. <clears throat> 2 minus 2, you know, up here, 2 minus 2 is just a 0. And then 0 minus 1 over here is also a 9 with a borrow of 1. So when it's time to figure out the overall borrow, I have to once again look at you know, x2 minus y2. That, that's okay, okay, because you know, 2 minus 2 does not need to borrow. But then when I look at q2 minus t2, I do need to borrow. So I end up with an overall borrow of 1 over here. So you look at this and go like, hmm, that doesn't seem right, okay? Because 261 is less than 267, but yet we end up with 994. Yes, we do, we do end up with 994, but there's a borrow from the thousands, okay? Because this borrow here, T3 being a 1, means I am borrowing a thousand in order to give us the result of 994. So if you subtract 1,000, which is what I owe from, one, from 994, we still get negative 6 back. So it's just another way to look at negative 6. So instead of saying, you know, it's a negative 6, I say that I have 994, but I owe 1,000. So it's still a net of negative 6. I mean, it's doing okay so far with this perspective of base 10 subtraction. Yes? Okay? So I'm going to do the same thing as last time, which means I'm going to extract the structure of the subtraction, and then we'll figure out the you know, two functions. There's one function called R, again, the single digit sub, uh, difference, and then we also end up with a B function, which is the borrow function. Is that okay? Okay, so let's figure out what the R function is. So the R function, R of xy, is in this case the single digit difference of subtracting y from x. And x, y are both single digits. Okay. So this is what I want to do. Uh, in other words, the single digit uh, difference between 1 and 7 is a 4. The single digit difference between 5 and 7 is an 8, and so on. Do we understand what is what the R function is trying to do? So instead of you know, giving us the single digit sum between two single digits, it is giving us the single digit difference between two digits. So let me just check and make sure that we really understand the concept. What is R of 3, 1? Two. It would just be 2. Very good. What about R of 1, 3? That's what? Eight. 8. Yep, 8 is correct. Uh, R of um, 3, 6. Seven, okay, very good. So do we have any questions about these particular examples in base 10? So we're still dealing with base 10. You good here? Okay, all right. So now if I need to write the function to do exactly what R is doing, what do you think the function is gonna look like? So if I need unsigned, R of unsigned, X and unsigned by what is that going to look like? What does it return? negation yet. We cannot use the Boolean thing yet. Uh, you are correct, okay? That is how you do it when we're dealing with base 2, I think. But we're not dealing with base 2 yet. We're still dealing with base 10, so these are the results that we want from this R function. Yep? 
X minus Y is a good starting point. <laughs> so X minus Y needs to be here. But remember, we are dealing with unsigned. So if X is less than Y, then X minus Y is not going to be a very nice number. It, because it's going to wrap around and become a really, really large you know, unsigned number. So what do we need to do? We just say, well, let's assume that X is less than Y. Okay. So what we do is we... We add a 10 to it all the time. Then you go like, but what if x is already greater than or equal to y? That 10 is not necessary. You're absolutely right. But there's no harm in doing this if we're going to mod it with a 10 anyway. So this way, I don't need the condition. I, need, I don't need to say, well, if x is less than y, then we add a 10. If x is not less than y, we do not add a 10. I just do a universal mod 10 after the entire sum, so this way it always works. Is that okay? All right. So that's one way to do it. You know, it's not the only way to do it. Not may not even be the most efficient way to do it. Just one way to do it. So what about um, the next operation? What about um, how do we figure out the borrows? So now we need to switch to um, different colors. So I'm going to switch to red first. Because I need to designate you know, each borrow, you know, where the borrow is coming from. So if I look at this particular borrow here, okay, why do you think I have a borrow here? Which two, uh, the subtraction of which two digits, you know, end up with this, you know, the result of this borrow being a one? X and Y. Okay, very good. So I'm going to use color coding again you know, to indicate that one minus seven needs to have a borrow, and that's why T1 is a one. Is that okay? All right. But that's not the only way we can end up with a borrow, because, okay, change the color again to green. So if I look at this particular borrow, it is not because of X1 minus Y1, because it's six minus six does not end up with a borrow. It does not need a borrow. But we, when we look at Q1 minus T1, we have a 0 minus 1. And that is what the reason why we have a borrow of 1. So that means you know, this is the reason why we have a 1 as our T2. Okay. So if you want, want to look at the third example, it's kind of the same deal. Okay. This time is in blue. So this one here is because of this particular 0 minus 1. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So the bottom line is if we are subtracting y from x and x is less than y, then we end up with a borrow of 1. So how do we write the borrow function? Um, I'm just going to say, you know, B of x, y. How do we define you know, the borrow of x minus y? What would that look like? And this time it's not a C function. It's just a mathematical function. How do we write this mathematical function? By the way, you can use ternary expressions, which makes it super easy to express it. So this becomes, if x is less than y, then we return the value of 1. Otherwise, we return the value of 0. That's actually a C syntax. So you know, basically, that's the return statement or the return expression in an actual C function. x is less than y, return a 1. x is not less than y, return a 0. So are we doing OK so far with the base 10 version of the R function and the B function? OK. So now we have to express how the digits relate to each other. So we have Q of i being the r of xi, yi again. We have T of i plus 1 being the B of xi, yi, or the B of uh, qi and ti. And then we have D of i being the r of qi and ti. That express you know, the relationship between all the digits. So once, as soon as I have x, y, 
and also T0, using these equations, I can figure out all the digits in any base, okay? But in this, in this particular example, we're dealing with base 10. All right, do we have any questions? Well, let's go through another example, okay? So I'm gonna erase one of these examples and then we'll work on it. All right, so I'm gonna erase this one. This one is not as elaborate as the other one, so if we can get rid of this one, okay? So instead of that, you know, we can use, uh, let's say 230, or minus um, 616, there we go, okay? This is digit zero, digit one, digit two. So those are basically the names of the columns and we have digit three over here. This is X, this is Y, this is Q, this is T, and this is D, okay? And T0 is still assumed to be 0 because I'm not stacking subtractions in this case. So the first question is, what is Q0 over here? Using the definition, okay? So Q0, by definition, is the R of xi, yi, and function R is defined like this. So in the example that we are now looking at, what is Q0? In other words, I'm asking, what is the R of 4, 6? The R of 4, 6, okay, you got a 4 here, you get a 6 here. So four, uh, 10 plus 4 is a 14, 14 minus 6 is an 8, 8 mod 10 is an 8. So that's why I put an 8 in here. Is that okay? Because what I'm doing is I'm applying the definitions down here, there are three of those, in order to compute the multi-digit difference in the subtraction. <clears throat> Are we doing okay? All right, so with Q and T both known, I can actually try to figure out D at this point. So I can figure out what is D zero, which goes into here. And D zero is the R between the Q zero and the T zero. Uh, Q zero is an eight, T zero is a zero. So I plug eight into X, zero into Y over here. So we have 10 plus eight, which is 18. 18 minus zero is still 18. 18 mod 10 is 8. So we end up with an 8 over here. There we go. So are we, are we good so far? Is that okay? Yes, hopefully. Okay. So now we need to figure out column 1. So let's look at Q1 first. So Q1 is, according to this, the R of X1, Y1. X1 is a 3, Y1 is a 1. So we have a 3 going into the X, a 1 going into the Y. So now we have 10 plus 3, which is a 13. 13 minus 1 is a 12. 12 mod 10 is a 2. Okay. So we put the 2 here. And now we need to deal with the more difficult one, which is a T, the borrow, the, the borrow bit. So the T here, which is T1, is based on the equation down here. So it's, you know, if I need to figure out what is T of 1, then I needs to be 0. Very good. So when I is 0, I need to first compute what is the B of X0, Y0. X0 is a 4, Y0 is a 6. Plug that into B of X, Y. So we have 4 being X, uh, 6 being Y. 4 is less than 6 is true. We return the true value in the ternary expression. So it is a 1. So now we have a one on this side. This is an arithmetic addition. And then on the other side, we have the B of Q0, T0. T zero. Q0 zero is an eight, T0 is a zero. So we plug those into the B function. We have B of eight, zero in this case. Eight is less than zero, it's false. So in a ternary expression, we return a zero. So now we end up with one plus zero over here, which is a one. And so I put a one here. Is that okay? In other words, I have just spent half an hour to make something that you already understand much more complicated than it needs to be. But nonetheless, it starts with something that you already know, okay? Multi-digit base 10 subtraction, okay? 
So we'll go ahead and figure out the D here. I'm going to speed up a little bit here because you know, otherwise we may not have enough time. And now we have 2 minus 6, the single digit difference. If you plug in the equation, it will give you a 6 over here. And then this digit here is um, going to be a 0 because B of 3, 1 is a 0. B of 2, 1 is also a 0. 0 plus 0 is a 0. We put a 0 here. And this becomes a 6 because the R of 6, 0 is a 6. And then we have only one more bit or one more digit to figure out, which is this one here. This one is going to be the B of 2, 6 plus the B of 6, 0. The B of 2, 6 is a 1. The B of 6, 0 is a 0. So we have 1 plus 0. That means we have a 1 over here. So what that means is 234 minus 616 has a result of 618 with a owing or with a borrow of 1,000. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. Now, if you look at this whole thing and go like, didn't we do something like that for addition? Good for you, because we did. <laughs> the purpose of doing this is to extract the pattern of multi-digit subtraction, and we did the same thing with addition. The reason why we want to extract that pattern is to basically end up with these three equations here. So if you have not done so, okay, you might want to write these three down uh, along with all of the other definitions yeah, because this is important. Okay, It is a definition, and definitions are the basis of how you can answer questions in an exam. Okay, That's the starting point. And that is why you really want to make it easy for yourself to find the definitions in an exam. All the exams in this class are open book and open notes. There are no excuses whatsoever of I cannot find the definition. All right? It's just that you don't, you don't want to wait until like a day or two days before the exam to start to make your, your notes or what people call the, uh, the study guide for the exam. You should be doing it all along. So this way you're not pushing everything down to like a few hours and you're starting to panic. You spread it out, okay? Every time we encounter definitions, you write it down, okay? On a separate piece of paper, and then you jot down some notes and go like, what this is for? Why do we need to understand this? And possibly the date, okay? And also the time of the lecture. So that way, if, ever, if you ever need to know, okay, but I cannot remember the lecture that talks about these definitions. Oh, it is on September 7th. And the exact time is 9.30 to you know, 30 you know, as a second. You can go back to the video, watch exactly just that portion. So you know, there are a lot of resources available to you in this class. You just have to make use of those resources. All right. So, well, base 10 is great, okay? Because you know, we work with base 10 because we got 10 fingers, but the computer only understands base two, right? So we need to convert everything here to work with base 2. So how do we do that conversion to base 2? If you look at the way R is defined, you look at how B is defined, you look at how QI, T of I plus 1, and D of I are defined, there's only one single reference to the base that we are using, which is base 10 here. Where is that reference? The mod 10. Oh, okay. So that means if I want to turn this into base 2, all I need to do, okay, I'm going to change to a red color here. So if I need to turn, change this to base 2, all I need to do is to say, yeah, we are not dealing with base 10 anymore. We're now dealing with base 2, but there's also one more, you know, which is here. So turn this into 2. So I lied, okay, because I said there's only one reference. There are actually two references to 10. And change both of those to two. Now we have a structure that will work with base two. Is that okay? All right. So if you are thinking, hmm, but didn't we do something exactly like this with base ten addition, and then we just changed the ten to a two, <coughs> then we ended up, ended up with the rules for base two addition? The answer is yes. 
This is exactly the same thing. We start off with something that we already know, which is base 10 subtraction in this case. We extract the structure out of it so that we can express the relationship between the digits in a mathematical way. And then we look at that particular abstraction and ask, okay, which part of this abstraction really is specific to base 10? Change all of those from 10 to two, and now we have a system that works on base two. Is that okay? All right, so now, we, that now that we know how to do base two subtraction, let's try it out, okay? Let's, so we're gonna go try out base two subtraction a little bit. And I'm going to try this tool here to erase. Okay, that's not uh, what I thought it would do. I'm trying to find a lasso tool so I can select a bunch of stuff and then just block, erase the entire thing. Lasso, there we go. Okay. Take the entire block here and delete. So where do I delete? Do you guys see? Oh, there we go. Cut. There we go. All right. So now we can get back to the pen tool. All right. So where's my pen tool? I don't think it's shape. Maybe it is. Okay. So I think we're back to the pen tool now. All right. So now we switch to base two and we start up with zero, one, one, zero. And then we subtract from that. Uh, let's say one, zero, one, one. Now it's the base two. We got X, we got Y, we got Q, we got T, we got D. Just like that. Okay. And then we have a T zero that is assumed to be zero. All right. So now we have base two subtraction. And all you have to do is to plug in all those digits back into these definitions along with the, de the new definitions of R versus B, okay? So we'll go ahead and do that. So we start with uh, Q0. What is Q0? According to this Q, uh, definition, Q0 is the R of X0, Y0. So we need to plug that the, the X here into the X of the R function. We plug the y0 into the y of the r function. So now we have 0 as x, uh, 1 as y. Uh, so we have 2 plus 0, which is a 2, minus 1. 2 minus 1 is a 1. 1 mod 2 is a 1. Okay, so we put a 1 over here. Do we have any questions? No questions? Now, if you ask... This seems, if you say this is, this seems to be pretty tedious. Yes, it is tedious because we are extracting the digits, plug it into the definitions of the QI, then we apply the R function and blah, blah, blah. But it is the same structure as what we did with base 10. The only difference is everything that mentions 10 is now mentioning two. All right, so now we move on to, eh, we can move on to this one over here. Oh, we can move on to this one, okay? Because we can just jump around as well, okay? As long as we have all the information, I don't need to follow the usual order of doing subtraction. So let's figure out what is T of one right now. So T of one, according to this, you know, is because in order to figure out T of one, I needs to be a zero. So that means I need to compute B of X zero, Y zero, plus B of Q zero, T zero. So B of x0, y0 is b of 0, 1, and then I plug that into the b function, which mentions nothing about base 10 at all, okay? So 0 is x0, 1 is y0, 0 is less than 1, that's true, so we have a result of 1. So the left-hand side of the addition is a 1. The right-hand side of the addition is the b of q0, t0, Q0 is a 1, T0 is a, is, a, is a 0. So now we have X as a parameter being 1, Y as a parameter being 0. 1 is less than 0, is false, so it returns a 0 here. So now we end up with a 1 on this side, plus a 0 on this side. 1 plus 0 is a 1, so we end up with a 1 over here. So once again, it is extremely tedious to use the definitions. Well, because it is not intended for human beings. 
all of this stuff here is intended for the computer. Okay, eventually we will also figure out how to do everything in logic gates. So if you think, oh, this is really tedious for a person to follow, yeah, it is. But, you know, it does establish the structure so that we can perform multi-digit subtraction in base two. So it's a good starting point, okay? It's not the end yet, okay? Because we still rely on a lot of arithmetic operations, but we're getting there. Okay, so uh, one minus one, let me just point out here. One minus one is, it has a single digit difference of a zero, okay? I think that's fairly obvious. One minus zero has a single digit of one. Zero minus one has a single digit difference of one. And then uh, to figure out this borrow here, one minus one does not have a borrow. Zero minus one does have, does have a borrow. So we end up with a borrow here. And then when we try to figure out this one, we have one minus zero does not need a borrow. One minus one also does not need a borrow. So we have zero plus zero. So therefore it is a zero over here. And then when we try to figure out the overall borrow, then we have zero minus one needing a borrow. 1 minus 0 does not have a borrow, so we have a 1 from B of 0, 1, and then we have a 0 of B of 1, 0, so now we end up with a 1 plus 0, which is a 1 that we need to put here. And then the rest is really just to figure out the D row. Uh, 1 minus 0 has a single digit difference of 1, 0 minus 1 has a single digit difference of 1, 1 minus 1 has a single digit difference of 0, and 1 minus 0 has a single digit difference of a 1. And there we go. It, you know, that's how we perform, that's how we perform multi-digit binary subtraction. Now, you look at this and go like, oh, that looks pretty easy. Your tech just got it done like that. So what you might want to do is to do this yourself, okay? Repeat this yourself just referencing the definitions of q, i, t of i plus 1, d of i, how we define the r function, and how we define the b function. Even if you think, I get it, okay, I know the theory, do it anyway, okay? Because by doing it by hand, just, just for this example, okay, you know, the ideas will sink in better. That's not something I want you guys to do right now, so you might want to jot down some notes and just say that, okay, you know, I might want to kind of do a little exercise after class to perform the single, to perform the binary subtraction using this particular example. Okay? And somebody's going to ask, but Tech, what if you made a mistake? Then, you know, then I cannot really cross-check my answer with your answer here. So I need to double-check. So one way to double-check and also to re- uh, and also to exercise my base conversion technique is to say, well, let's convert these binary numbers into base 10 numbers and see if it's still, and see if they still make sense. 0, 1, 1, 0 is what we know as 6 in base 10. 1011 1, 1 is what we know as 11 in base 10. 6 minus 11 is 5 with a borrow of 1. So, so it is negative 5, wait, 6 minus 1 is 5 with a borrow, and 0 minus 1 is 1, 1 minus that borrow is here, and then we end up with a borrow overall in base 10. So this means, you know, in base 10, I end up with a 5 as the answer, but I have a borrow from, no, that doesn't make sense, okay. Let me redo this. <clears throat> okay, so we have 6 minus 11 in base 10. So I'm going to do the um, multi-digit subtraction thing, you know, like the other one. So now we have 6 minus 1 is a 5. 5 minus a 0 is a 5. This is a 0. 0 minus 1 is a 9. 9 minus this 0 is also a 9. And then we have 0 minus 1 needing a borrow. So we have an overall borrow here. There we go. So this is the correct way to do it. So it means in base 10, we 
have 6 minus 11 ending up with a value of 95, but with a borrow, and that borrow is borrowing how much? 100. 100, very good. So if I have $95 in my pocket, but I owe the bank 100 bucks, what is my net worth? Negative 5, exactly. Okay, that kind of makes sense, but what about in phase 2, does that make sense? So now we look at the base 10 results, okay? We look at, and let me switch to a different color, so this way it's a little bit easier for us to see what we, what's happening. This is a 6, this is a 11, and here we have another 11. Okay, so basically what we are saying is 6 minus 11 has a result of 11. Wait, but that's not the entire story, is it? Because we still have this borrow here. What is the quantity of this borrow being T4 in base 2? It is a 16. So that, that's good, okay? So I owe 16. So if I have 11 bucks in my pocket and I owe $16, my net worth is still just negative 5. So that means I have just validated this particular calculation because by converting the base in, in back into base 10 and carry out the base 10 subtraction, I still end up with negative 5. And the way to interpret the binary result also ends up with negative 5 as a quantity because I have 11 in my pocket, but I owe 16. That's what the overall borrow of T4 is trying to express. All right. Are we good so far? Okay. So we'll, we'll take a short break. You know, we're going to take row first, and then we'll come back. And when we do come back, we'll go ahead and take a look at, but how do we do all, all of this without arithmetic operations? So that's what we'll do next. And we are, today is the 7th. So this is our row taking activity. The passcode is recursion. <laughs> all lowercase, okay, recursion, all lowercase. And let me publish the activity. You should be able to do it now, and you have until 10 o'clock to do it. Okay, does anyone need more time to finish the road taking activity? Nope. Okay, all right. And we are going to move on. All right, so moving on, what we're going to do is to make truth tables. So what we're going to do is to say these x, y are just names, okay? They do not correlate with the rows x and y. So x is a single digit in base 2, it can be 0 or 1. y is a single digit in base 2, it can also be 0 or 1. So now I have listed all four possible ways in terms of the combination of the values of x and y. Let me switch back to the usual color. There we go. <clears throat> all right, so the next thing we want to do is to ask, if we just apply your know, r of x, y in base 2, what are we going to get? So I have to re-emphasize that we are dealing with base two here, and then we will try to figure out what what about the base, uh, what about the b of x y? But we'll figure out one thing at a time. So we're going to focus on b of x y at this point. All right. So can someone tell me what is the single digit difference of zero minus zero? Okay, that's an easy one. The next one is the only one that is a little bit harder, which is what is the single digit difference of 0 minus 1, but in base 2. It's 1. Okay, very good. The next one should be fairly easy. 1 minus 0 is 1. And then 1 minus 1 is 0. Very good. Okay. 
you look at this R X Y column. Does that remind you of anything? If it does not, I start to worry. Haven't we seen this before? Because addition, binary addition, has exactly the same R function. Not in base ten, okay? In base ten, the R function is different, but in base two. It's the same R function as in addition. And that's why I kept the name of R. Because in base two, it is the same R function. So if it's the same R function, how do we do this using logic gates? Exclusive or is the easy answer? What is the not so easy answer? What if we don't have exclusive or as a gate? The trick to figure that one out is we look at the cases where it is a one. So one case where it is a one is when x is false, y is true. So that will give, <coughs> excuse me. So that row alone means you know not x and y is going to be true, but only for this row. Does that make sense? Because only this row has x being false and y being true. So if I negate x first and then end it with y, then this row would return a value of true, but only for this row. This expression returns false for every other row. So now we work on the other one. This one has one x being true, y being false. So that means if I have x and the negation of y, then this expression, this little sub-expression here, is going to be true, but only for this specific row. But the R function needs both of these rows to be a 1. So the easiest way to combine these two and say, well, but I need this row to be a 1, but this row also needs to be a 1, is to say, yeah, we'll just put in the OR. So this way, you know, we implement the same thing as exclusive OR. In other words, I have just explained why this expression, which is not x and y or x and dot y, is doing the same thing as exclusive OR. This is a quick and easy way to derive a Boolean expression for any truth value column. So you can turn anything into just a, a or of a bunch of ands. All right. So that's an easy one. So now we look at the B function. So once again, we got x, y as independent variables. And we have the same four rows here. But this time we are concerned about what about b of x, y. In other words, when we subtract y from x, do we need a borrow of 1? That's basically what we're asking. All right, so do we need a borrow when we subtract 0 from 0? Nope. What about subtracting a 1 from a 0? Yep. What about subtracting a 0 from a 1? Nope. What about subtracting a 1 from a 1? Nope. Okay, so this one, you look at this and go like, oh, man, you know, the C function is not going to work. In other words, X and Y is not going to work. But if you just go up a little bit, <laughs> we already have our solution. Because we only have one single row that needs to return a, a value of 1, and I worked that out already. So that means in this case, all we really need is not X and Y. Then that's it. So the B function is the same thing as not x and y. The R function is the same as before, which is x exclusive or y, or you can choose the longer format. You know, either one would do the trick. Are we still doing okay so far? Translating from arithmetic operations into Boolean or logical operations. So now everything can, once again, be done using logic gates. Is that okay? All right. So after we do all of this stuff here, then we can re-express the relationships between the digits. Q of i is once again x of i exclusive or with y of i. You go like, oh, okay, you cannot see it because uh, the, okay, let me move the screen down a little bit. There we go. Okay. So you look at this one and go like, wait, but that's exactly the same as a binary addition thing. The answer is yes, it is exactly the same. 
So you can look at S of I, I mean D of I this time, sorry. D of I is also Q of I exclusive or with T of I this time, okay? Instead of K of I, we have T of I. So the only one that may be different is T of I plus one. So when you look at T of I plus one, it is now X of I and, um, let me see, the negation of X of I and Y of I, or, well, okay, I jumped a step here, but it's okay. Or um, Q of I, the negation of Q of I and T of I. You look at this and go like, well, that's not exactly the same as what we had before, but it's pretty close. Because with addition, what we had for k of i plus 1 is xi and yi, okay, without the negation of xi, uh, or q of i and k of i without the negation of q of i. So this one looks eh, awfully similar. And it has a similar problem. Because t of i plus 1 depends on t of i. So once again, we have that linear dependency where we go like, oh, so that means, you know, until I know what is T of 1, I cannot figure out what is T of 2. Until I know T of 2, I cannot figure out T of 3, and so on. So we, once again, it is easy to make a borrow ripper subtractor, but it is not very efficient. Because, you know, the, the more bits you're trying to subtract, the longer it's going to take. Yes? Which again? Sorry. About the of linear consistency. Linear consistency. Okay. So the linear portion has to do with, in order to figure out T of I plus 1, I need to know what is T of I. So that means, you know, until I know what is T of 1, I cannot figure out what is T of 2. Until I know what is T of 2, I cannot figure out what is T of 3, and so on. So there's a linear dependency that I cannot get rid of using just these equations. All right, so bummer, sort of, but we can fix that problem, okay? So let's take a look in the notes because you know, those derivations, I don't want to handwrite because you know, that's, it's, it's a little bit involved, okay? So we are actually all done all the way down to here, okay? So this one is a little bit more involved. You know, you know, don't bother with you know, understanding the actual derivation unless you have already taken CISP 440. Then you should know Boolean algebra enough to understand the derivation. So this is going to be a quick check to see whether your CISP 440 knowledge has sunk in or not. How many people have taken CISP 440? Okay, so are you guys kind of relating what we are talking about in this class, in this class with 440? It helps so much. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. Is just okay? Some of that is a review, right? You know, some of the stuff is new, but it is related. Uh, this is also why, you know, when you go to a four-year university, you can be taking like three classes in computer science in one semester. But if you can figure out how these classes relate, you might feel like, oh, it feels like I'm just taking two classes instead of three because you know, the overlap and also the correlation between the topics can actually make it seem like that you are, you're not spending nearly as much effort as you would otherwise you're know, taking three completely independent classes. So that's one thing that you can try to do is to figure out how, does, how do these topics in one class relate to those topics in a different class. You know, that, really helps when it comes to you know, efficiency of studying. All right, so the bottom line is this entire derivation does not solve the problem. Well, not directly, because you can see how t of i plus 1 still depends on t of i. Darn it. So it doesn't really solve the problem, but it changes the way t of i plus 1 is expressed using t of i. Okay. Because now we have a chunk of things you know, called the negation of T of I and Y of I, or in parentheses, not X of I or Y of I. 
So this time, you probably want to kind of jot this down too, <laughs> because this paragraph looks super innocent, but it's also very important. So now we redefine g of i to be the negation of x i and y i, and then we, we redefine p of i to be the negation of x i or y i. You go like, hmm. That seems similar to something that we have encountered, but it's not exactly the same. And then you'll be correct, because in addition, g of i is just a conjunction between x i, y i, without negating x i first. And then also in uh, addition, p of i is defined to be x i or y i, without negating the x of i first. Here, it is very similar, but we just have to negate x of i first, and remember to negate x of i first in both cases. But what is that going to buy us, right? So what that's going to buy us is now we can re-express t of i plus 1 to be g of i or p of i and t of i. Now, okay, if you have been following, you know, the whole thing on Tuesday about carry look ahead, you know, adder, and how we simplify the whole thing, you look at this thing you here go like, but tech, isn't that exactly the same as what we did with addition? Except instead of k of something, now we have t of something. And if you're thinking, I'm not quite remembering that stuff. Well, we still have the addition thing here. So let me go to that portion so that you can see what I'm talking about here. Right here. See this thing here? k of i plus 1 is g of i plus p of i and k of i. Okay, let me do this trick here. Okay, this this may work for this class. So I'm just you're doing a tiny little screenshot here and open this using a program. And we'll make it always on top. So this way when I switch to the other tab, it will still be here. And I will put it side by side. Woohoo! look exactly the same, except instead of k of something, which is the carry, now we have t of something, which is really just borrow, but I call it take, okay? You go like, so that whole trick of using substitution would also work here, because the substitution trick has nothing to do with, oh, you know, we have a negation over here, this is actually subtraction, and that's the addition. The whole substitution trick that we did with addition has to do with once we know what is k of 1, we plug in k of 1 and we ex re-express k of 2, so k of 2 does not need to reference k of 1 anymore. Once we know what is k of 2, we plug that in to you know, the equation to figure out k of 3, so k of 3 eventually does not need to reference k of 2 anymore. None of this has anything to do with adding or subtracting, the negation of something. No, all of these has only has to do with, we have a term called a generator or generative term, g of something, and then we have a propagation term called p of something. As long as the template of the equation fits into this particular overall format, it will work. So that means in subtraction, we have almost exactly the same thing. It is the same insane you know, definition down here. Okay, So if you remember that insane definition down here, in addition, this is for subtraction. It looks exactly the same, except you know, everywhere that we used to use k, k, they are now t's. Very slight difference. And then the P and the G's are defined slightly different. And or, or instead of or and or. Hmm? It is still the same. You know, it's just that I forgot to put in the extra parentheses. Okay, so let me uh, kind of look at the other one too. Because I just put in extra parentheses with the other one to make it extra clear. Okay, I'll do the same trick as the other time. So take this one. Uh, we don't need this one anymore. So we click that. Switch back to the subtraction, and there we go. They are the same, except you know, in this case, 
I made it extra clear this is the entire expression for each iteration of i. And then over here, it is kind of implicit because, you know, uh, because of the associative associativity, you know, it, it, it can be implicit in this case. Because we carry out um, conjunction before we carry out disjunction. So the extra pair of parentheses that would have otherwise gone between here and here are really not necessary, but it helps to kind of visualize which part is being controlled by the outer loop and which part is controlled by the inner loop. But it's exactly the same. Isn't that great? You know, you can just kind of recycle what we know already and just go like, oh, okay, that's easy to do. You guys do not seem particularly excited right now, but we have just figured out how to use transistors to add and to subtract. <clears throat> and guess what your processor really can do natively? Add and subtract. You go like, but what about multiplication? That's using add and subtract. What about division? That's using add and subtract. What about comparison? That's just also using add and subtract. So adding and subtracting is really, really at the core of every computation that you ever want your computer to perform. And now we have the circuit to do it. We have the transistors and the structure to expand because you know, who's going to use a 3-bit by 3-bit adder, right? I mean, that's not even a bit. But we know the equation, okay, the two equations here, we know the equations to make a larger adder if we need to, okay? So the idea is we now know the method to make a bigger adder if we need to make a bigger adder. Are we still doing okay so far? We good? Okay. All right. Well, we are zooming right here. Okay. So until somebody has a question or ask me to pause, you know, we are just going to keep going. Are we good? All right. <laughs> I really have to make sure because, you know, we are going at a pretty good pace here. All right, so what is the next slide? Okay, so I might have to come back and re-explain things you know, if people want me to, um, but what we're gonna talk about next is signed versus unsigned representation. Okay, so we are moving on to yet another new module. I wasn't expecting the uh, progress to be this fast, but that's okay. All right, so the first thing we need to understand is when you look at the memory of a computer, and when you look at how integers are represented, we only allocate a certain number of bits, okay? One bit is a binary digit, and that's why it's called a bit, okay? The Bs you know, come, is coming from binary, and then the IT is coming from digit. So a binary digit or a bit is a single digit in base two. So when you say int, okay, in C++, what is the width of an int? How many bits are we allocating to an int or to an unsigned? It's a trick question because it depends on the compiler. If you're on a 32-bit platform, typically the int or unsigned would be 32-bit wide. If you're on a 64-bit platform, then the int or the unsigned is typically 64-bit. That's just a rule of thumb, okay? There are no actual specification of C or C++ to designate the width of an integer. So how do you find out? There are a few ways, okay? So let me see if you guys know how to use a debugger. Or without a debugger, you can still find out it's just a little bit more obscure. So how do you find out what is the native width of an unsigned or an integer? You know, just put you but unsigned first. How do you figure that out? <clears throat> I need to have a recording of the the Jeopardy music. Dum, 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 dum. Yes. Size of. Size of yes. 
So size of is the actual way to determine that. And you can use size of in GDB without even writing a program to debug. So let me show you how we can do that. And yep, well, that's good enough. Just magnify that. All right. So before we go there, okay, the first question is how many people were introduced to the concept of a debugger in your other programming language, the programming classes? I am shocked. How did you guys debug your program without a debugger? Yes. Poking it until it broke, broke and then fixing it again? It's kind of like fixing a car, like a really old-fashioned car with all the vacuum tubes running around in the entire engine. By pulling and plugging those, you know, those tubes, you know, just in, in different orders and go like, maybe this will fix the problem. Nope, that doesn't even fix it. Let me try something else. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you might end up, you know, causing more damage to the engine than fixing it. Yeah, the same thing can be said about spark plugs. It's like, hmm, the car is not running smooth. Maybe the ordering of the spark plug is wrong. Let me just kind of swap these two. <laughs> that may not be a good idea. It actually won't cause any problem because only one of the cylinder would actually have the gas, uh, the air gas mi mixture. So if you try to detonate you know, the light of the spark plug in a cylinder that does not have the fuel air mixture, it's not going to cause a problem. Okay, it would just go through the exhaust you know, cycle. It just spews out you know, the gas you know, without burning it first. So it's actually not going to cause a problem. Not that I recommend you to try it. <laughs> All right. So we're going to use the debugger, GDB. Okay. And inside GDB, even without a program to debug, I can now just say print size of, which is an operator. Okay. The funny thing, it's called an operator. So we can say that. And it is four. Four of what? Four bits? What is the most basic unit to measure uh, the amount of memory on most computers today? Bytes, right, okay. So four bytes, which is 32 bit. Okay, so now we can also say what is the size of unsigned? It should be the same. It's also four. So what do I need to do to say, but I need 64 bits. What do we do? So how do you make sure that you end up with a larger or a wider integer in your program? Because you can potentially reach you know, a value that is more than 4 billion. Because 4 bytes can only give you up to about 4 billion as an unsigned. So if you ever need to count or calculate things, that can go beyond 4 billion, you need to take the next step up. So, yes. Long. long, very good. So a long int is, oh, okay. So maybe we need to say long, long. There we go. That sounds like a person, long, long. Is that a person who plays a certain musical instrument? I think it's a pianist, that's it. No, no, no. It's, uh, I think it's long, long. Well, I, I guess it depends on the uh, romanization. So pianist, have to type this really carefully. Lang, lang. Okay, so it's lang, lang in, uh, in Mandarin. But it's, you know, in Cantonese, it's pronounced as long, long. Yeah, so there we go. All right. Huh? Say again? Long, long. A uh, lang, lang, L A N G. So that's a that's the uh, the can that's the Mandarin pronunciation is L A N G, but in Cantonese it's more like long, long. All right. So there you go. So it makes it really begs the question of can we have one more long here, right? And it does not like that. <laughs> so you can only have long, long ends, but not long, long, long ends. It is kind of interesting. All right. So there we go. So the, the next question is, what about the range of values 
or a 32-bit number as opposed to a 64-bit number. How do we figure that out? So if you just look at the unsigned representation, what do you think is the largest value you can represent using 32 bits? Okay, so let's switch to the tablet for this discussion. Okay, so we have the unsigned 32-bit integer. Uh, we know the minimum value has to be zero because you basically just have all 32 bits being zeros and it is representing just zero. So what is the pattern of representing the highest possible, the maximum value using only 32 bits? All ones, right? So when you have all ones, what are you looking at? You're looking at one plus two plus four plus eight plus blah, 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 all the way to two to the power of what? Hmm? 31. Okay. So it is summing all the way up to 31 because this is one bit already. This is 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, blah, blah, blah. And if you count 32 bits, you only count up to 2 to the power of 31 and not 32. Okay? So what is the other way to, to write this? This seems pretty, uh, seems pretty hairy. Yep. Minus one. Yep. So this becomes 2 to the power of 32 minus 1. Of course, you know, the next question is why and how do we prove this? So the why part can be observed by using um, just smaller numbers. So you can basically say, okay, let's work with smaller numbers. 2 to the power of, two to the power of 0 is 2 to the power of 1 minus 1. Yeah, that works out because 2 to the power of 0 is 1. 2 to the power of 1 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. Okay, let's move on to the next one. 2 to the power of 0 plus 2 to the power of 1 should be 2 to the power of 2 minus 1. Is it the case? Yeah, because we got a 1 plus a 2, which is a 3, and then on the other side, we have a 4 minus 1. Yeah, that seems to work out. What about the next one? One plus two plus four is a seven. Eight minus one is also a seven. So can we just say that, yes, we have proven the theorem. We are done here. No. <laughs> no, we have only shown that for the first three cases, the theorem works out. Okay, But we have not shown anything about if you have a sigma where i goes from zero to some arbitrary n, and then you are summing 2 to the power of i. This should become 2 to the power of n minus n plus 1, the whole thing minus 1. This is a theorem. And then we have to say this theorem should work for n being any natural, natural number. So this theorem, you know, is not easy to prove. Um, I believe I actually have this proven in one of my modules. So um, for those of you who have taken 440, you should be able to work this out using proof by induction. Do they teach proof by induction in 440? Kind of. Kind of? We didn't really go over the proof. I had a terrible professor for it. <laughs> Okay, so in 440, you know, they should teach your know, proof by induction, and this is a classic example of you know, how you can use proof by induction. Is uh, There are two steps in proof by induction. There's the base step, where you say, what if n is just zero? That's easy to prove, because if, when n is zero, then we're only looking at two to the power of zero being one, and then on the other side, we have two to the power of one minus one, which, you know, which establishes the equality. Then you have the induction step. The induction step is to assume the theorem works when n equals to k. Don't ask why, you know, but that's an assumption. And your, the only step you have to do is to use that assumption to prove that the theorem is also true when n is k plus 1. That's the, that's the induction step. Once you establish the induction step, then you're done. 
you know, you have proven the theorem itself. So this is not 440. I'm not going to go through the proof, but I can tell you this is true. Okay. So that means if you want to figure out what is the largest number a 32-bit number can represent, it is two to the power of 32 minus one, which is four billion something. So how do we know it is four billion something? Because I have taught this class for many years. That's one. But there's a trick to it, too. So the trick to figure out the, the, the magnitude of a number, something like, okay, I'll pick something else. Okay, we'll pick uh, 2 to the power of 57. Okay, I just pull this out of, the thin, out of thin air. But I want to know approximately what kind of range we are talking about. So I'll rewrite this as 2 to the power of 10. That whole thing to the power of 5 times 2 to the power of 7. Is that part okay? Okay. So what is so special about 2 to the power of 10? 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024, which is, for estimation purposes, close enough to 1,000, which we are familiar with. Okay. So we'll just say that 2 to the power of 10, which is exactly 1,024, is close enough to 1,000, which is 10 to the power of to the third, okay? So that means you know, if I need to estimate, okay, what is the, the value of two to the power of 57, I can now just say, hmm, it's about the same as 10 to the power of three to the power of five times two to the power of seven, which is 128. So now I just look at this number and go like, oh, okay, so that's 128 with 15 zeros after it, okay? Three, six, nine, <coughs> twelve, and fifteen. So this is how we can do a really quick estimate based on you know just it's a power of two, and then we just do a quick estimate, and this one becomes you know basically one point two eight times ten to the power of seventeen. Okay, because we got seventeen digits after the one point something. All right. So these are just kind of nifty tricks you know, that you can do you know, so that in order to do a rough estimate of the capacity of a hard drive or a file system or something like that, you know, this can be applied. All right, so we do have a lab today. Let me go ahead and give you guys the lab. But please read all the module over the weekend you know, because we just covered two additional module and starting on the third one you know, toward the end of the lecture. So today's lab is uh, carry look ahead adder. Um, so we got part one and part two. We're only doing part one today. Oh, okay, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. Um, okay, so something went wrong with the recording because the screen is locked. All right, so I, I have to check the recording because the voice is still going. It still says it's recording, but it doesn't seem to be refreshing the screen. So I have to figure out what is happening there. But as far as today's lab is concerned, these are the two things. You know, one is a file submission only, and the other one has the usual format of it's a quiz. It contains instructions. You guys have to kind of follow it. You have to use Logisim today. And there's a Logisim file to turn in as this particular part here. Uh, there's also a test driver. So if you want to double check to make sure that your circuit works as expected, you should run through the test driver, just like you know, with the other two homework assignments. And then the access code to this one is 3x3 part 1. So 3x3 because you know, it's a 3x3 you know, adder. I'll, I'll write it on the right too. So 3x3 part 1. There we go. <coughs> All right. So do we have any questions? Nope. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recorder and kind of check what's going on with OBS because it, what I can see in the preview is kind of locked, but I'm not sure whether it is actually recording correctly. It's just not showing that it's recording what we are seeing. So I'm going to have to figure that out. <laughs>